Glad that you're here with us this morning. Kind of a little bit different as we're starting. We're starting with uh, the welcome and announcements. Uh, we have a, uh, we have a uh, special service uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to be doing a kind of a for us to be able to kind of share what Celebrate Recovery is doing. A great time to have uh, our CR leaders here, have some people from CR here um, to be able to speak. And so we're excited about that. And uh, so this morning is going to be a little bit different. And uh, different is good every once in a while. It kind of just makes everything uh, shake things up every once in a while. So I'm so glad uh, um, CR is a part of our church. I'm very glad that CR is uh, done here in, in, the, in the cross and what CR is doing for this community and for those who come who are seeking to better themselves and better their lives. Just a few announcements as we begin. Remember, Celebrate Recovery is tomorrow night here at the cross. Um, we have a meal starting at 515 um, six o'clock, we have worship time with a Bible lesson or testimony, according which night it is. And then at seven o'clock, we split. Uh, women go to one part of the church, men go to another part of the church. They split into individual groups uh, with whatever their struggle may be and be able to talk and to be able to help one another and just support one another. And so if you are dealing with a hurt, a habit, or hang up that you're just struggling with in your life and you just need uh, just somewhere where you can go to be supported, somewhere you can go to talk about the things you're dealing with, just a safe environment. Celebrate Recovery is the pl place for you. And that's tomorrow night, Monday night, 5.15 for the meal, 6 o'clock for the service. A um, few things coming to uh, the Sunday morning service. We do have uh, a youth Sunday school class that's going to be starting here on August 15th. Um, it's going to be done by, uh, led by Scott King, and so we're excited about that. So um, that's next week, and so if your youth uh, are looking for a Sunday school class, we're going to have one once again for you, and uh, Scott King is going to lead that, and we're excited about the direction that he's going to be taking with our youth on Sunday morning. Finally, Wednesday night service is back this week. It'll be uh, our first service back from uh, summer break. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of Galatians uh, through the fall, and so um, please come out, be a part of that. Remember, Wednesday night Bible study is kind of an interactive time where um, we go over passages and you're able to respond with questions, you're able to respond with resp uh, responses to what you're, what's going on in the teaching, and so uh, we would love to have you come out and be a part of Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. starting this Wednesday night. And like I said, we're going to be talking about the book of Galatians. If you'll please stand. Let us go before the Lord in prayer as we begin. Heavenly Father, most gracious God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for this time to be in your presence. We thank you just for the opportunity to take a break from the week and to be able to just focus in on your love, your mercy, your grace, and your truth. I pray right now, Father, that your presence would be made known in this service today. Jesus, we invite you into this place. Holy Spirit, come and fill us, and we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. You may all be seated. My name is Terry, and I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I attend, and let me tell you, our loss is definitely your gain. Um, 
But I got involved with Celebrate Recovery when they started it. I wanted to be here to give them encouragement. We'd lost a young man in our church to an overdose, and I wanted to help others that were going through that, and I wanted there to be no more Nick's moms. I wanted to help those moms. And to me, that is the misconception of any recovery program, is that it's for people who have a chemical addiction. But I can guarantee you, every single one of us in this room has a hurt, has a habit, or has a hang-up. And the foundation of Celebrate Recovery is that our freedom from those comes from the cross. That is the foundation of Celebrate Recovery if you have an anger issue, if you have whatever. The list goes on and on and on. The Bible clearly states we're all sinners, and we've all fallen short of the grace of God. But through Celebrate Recovery, you can find freedom from whatever is, you feel is holding you back because the freedom comes from the cross. And the best thing about Celebrate Recovery is we take our masks off. And people take me for who I am, and help build each other up. I've gotten to know, through Celebrate Recovery, the people behind an addiction. They're people. And I'm so thankful that the Cross Church has come together to support Celebrate Recovery. Because without the Cross support, there wouldn't be a Celebrate, Repro Celebrate Recovery program here every Monday night. Changed and transformed you're going to see some of them here in a little bit. It's amazing the when they come in and they don't want to speak at all in small group. And now we're like, okay, your five minutes are up. You know, because they have become so self-confident in themselves that they can say, this is who I am. This is where I was. But I want to give a challenge because I don't go to this church. I feel like I can throw out a challenge to you guys and, you know, you can be there. You may be sitting here thinking, Get with Debbie, get with Hector, get with Pastor Martin, say, what can I help to do behind the scenes? It may be as simple as, hey, I can bring a dessert for your Monday night meal. That would be greatly appreciated. It could be as simple as, I'll stand here and greet people as they're coming in on Monday evenings. The people in the community need to see the face of the church supporting them as well. So I'm going to throw that challenge out to you guys to see what you can do to get involved and you're going to stay for the large group, and then you're going to stay for the small group, and you're going to see what Jesus Christ has in store for you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Terry. You don't have to take off. You can stay right up here. Terry does such a great job mentoring the women, sponsoring women. Celebrate Recovery has been a blessing to me. But my name Support. I want people to know that the stigma is celebrate recovery is just for people who do drugs. Yes, it is, because that's me. But it's also for people who don't do drugs. Also for people who suffer grief, depression. Sometimes I give people anxiety by yelling, but that's okay, because I want to glorify God. I want to give the word of God however it may be, because everyone's worth the love that God has, because it's all about love. I could sit here, and I could stand here, and I could yell and scream, but what brings all of it together is the love, and that's what we have on Monday. We need to take, Pastor Martin said it one time, and I'm going to use it, we need to take what we got here on Sunday, bring it to Monday, and go through the rest of the week, because that's what it's all about. Thank you, guys. We're going to read... Uh, celebrate Recovery's Eight Principles. Takes two of us. <laughs> I realize I'm not God. 
I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Happy are those who know that they are spiritually poor, Matthew 5, 3. Earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, Matthew 5, 4. Consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. Happy are the meek, Matthew 5, 5. Openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. Happy are the pure in heart, Matthew 5, 8. Voluntarily submit to any and all changes God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove my character defects. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires, Matthew 5, 6. Evaluate all my relationships, offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me, and make amends for harm I've done to others when possible, except when to do so would harm them or others. Happy are the merciful, Matthew 5, 7. Happy are the peacemakers, Matthew 5, 9. Reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer in order to know God and his will for my life and to gain the power to follow his will. <laughs> Yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and my words. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires, Matthew 5.10. That's it.
As we go to the Lord in prayer today, um, as always here at the cross, we want to give you an opportunity just to be able to come before the Lord if you're dealing with the things of life and the struggles of life and there's just things that you just don't seem, uh, aren't going right. You know, um, we know this life can be hard. We know the struggles that can happen. And sometimes we just need to take a moment. We just need to refocus on Christ. Our habit, as they would say, to celebrate recovery. Um, We can find freedom. We can find victory, not in ourselves and what we do, but find victory in Him because He secured the victory for us on the cross. And so this morning, if you just feel led to and you want to come, won't you come as we sing?
Heavenly Father, most gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. Father, we thank you that you are willing to send your Son for us. Jesus, we thank you that you were willing to come and die upon the cross for our sins. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence this morning, always speaking to our hearts, always guiding us, always helping us. Lord, today I pray for those who have knelt before you, those who stand before you today, and those who are watching on Facebook. Whatever the struggles may be, whatever the trials that they may be going through, Lord, that you would just speak to their hearts right now. Lord, you would just surround them with your love and your grace. Lord, that they might apply the truth of your word to their lives and their situations. And Lord, that your mighty power might reign in the situation, but even more in their lives. Lord, as we turn our attention this morning to the message, Father, let it be your message, not mine. Lord, whatever it is that you want me to share this morning, Lord, let me share it, not out of myself, but Lord, that I might echo your voice for your people, and they might receive your word today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I am going to apologize right away to my sound crew, which I appreciate this morning, and we've already had some issues and technical difficulties, uh, uh, but um, the sermon notes that I have and the message that I have, we're not going to be using those today. We'll use them at another point. <laughs> I have a... I have a different... I just... I feel God is calling me to do something different this morning. And so we're going we're gonna to move, we're going to move where God wants us to move, and I pray this is what God wants. I pray this this morning, and I just feel that this is the way we're going to go. So, Lord, you lead. Um, I uh, was getting ready for the military, and uh, one of the things you have to do is you have to go to this place called MEPS, and MEPS is a place where you go, you do all the paperwork, you do all of the... Um, Basically, you do all of the fitness, physical, that kind of stuff. Make sure you're ready for the military. And one of the things is, is that you have to spend the night at a hotel 
in the city that you're going to go uh, to the MEP Center the next morning. And so uh, the place that I was in at the time was New York. I was in the state of New York at that time. My dad was at a church uh, right outside of Albany, and I had to um, go to Albany and spend the night at a hotel in Albany, New York. And so I was in this room, and I was with a guy. He was really nervous. He was getting ready to go in the Army. I would have been nervous, too, if I was going in the Army. Uh, <laughs> it's a little big. Ah, oh, yeah, dig on my Army brothers. I was just messing. <laughs> but no, he was very nervous. He was nervous because he was going to basic training the next day and just wondering what was going to go on, what was going to happen. And so he wanted to take a walk. I didn't know this guy from Adam or anybody else, you know, but I'm like, sure, let's go take a walk. In a city that I don't know, let's go ahead and take a walk. Sounds like a right, smart plan, right, you know? And so we begin this uh, walk, and it's beautiful out, it's crisp, it's a cold night, and uh, the lights are shining, it's a beautiful place, everything looks amazing, the storefronts are all decorated, uh, it's getting closer to Christmas, it's just really beautiful. And we keep walking and, you know, feel safe, feel secure, feel everything's good, everything's going well. Well, we start making a couple turns here, a couple turns there, and the lights start to get dimmer. And downtown gets further away. The hotel gets further away. And uh, literally, we turn down a couple more streets, and before I knew it, I looked very out of place. Everybody that was walking by me, uh, I was dressed uh, kind of in, in a leather jacket, jeans, kind of a preppy type look, if you know what the preppy type look looks like, you know. And I'm walking down and uh, people are dressed totally different. They're staring at me. It's the middle of the night. It's dark. And I'm getting an uneasy feeling. And I want to turn around, but I don't know how to tell this guy I want to turn around. He keeps walking. I don't want to leave him because now then I'd be by myself, and uh, this is not a good situation. But literally, we get to a point, and I, I, I realize he's starting to get worried too. He's starting to get afraid. And I turned to him. I said, look, I think we need to turn around. I think it's time. And he's like, well, look, there's this alley right across the street. If we cut through this alley... Yeah, you're already laughing. You know what's going to happen. We go to go across this alley. It is the darkest alley that I have ever seen in my life. If there was a horror movie, that would be the alley that you turned down to go. That would have been it. I'm serious. It was just a dark, dark, dark place. But we were so afraid, and we wanted to get back to the place that we knew. We saw the lights were over there. We saw the downtown where we had been was over there. It looked like the best place to go. So we go to cross the street. And as we go to cross the street, out of nowhere comes an unmarked cruiser car. Didn't know where this car came from, didn't see this car before, didn't see it parked on the street, but it came out of nowhere. And the window rolls down, and the first thing I hear is I see a badge flash, and it says, we're cops, what are you doing down here, are you trying to get drugs? I'm like, no, no, you know, I'm a pastor's kid here, like, you know, I'm not trying to get anything, I'm just trying to get back. We just took a walk and we got lost, and <laughs> we want to get back to where it's safe, and he's like... All right, here's what you do. I want you to turn around right now. He said, if you go down this street, you will surely die. If you go down this street, you will surely die. There was kids your age just a week ago who were shot and killed down this alley. Turn around, head back as fast as you can without bringing uh, any more attention to yourselves. Get back to where you belong. That was probably one of the most scariest moments in my life. We never saw the cop car again. We turned around and we hurried as fast as we could back the path that we were in to get back to the light uh, that was uh, shining off in the distance. And I think about that experience and I think about my spiritual walk. I think about the time when I went into the military just a few months later, 
and how I knew where I was supposed to be in my life. What I learned as a kid in church, what I learned in Sunday school, what I learned in all of these things, and how quickly when I joined the military, how quickly because I left going to church, I left reading my Bible, praying, all of these things that I knew could give me life, give me purpose, give me hope in my life, and I went to seek through other ways to get pleasure and happiness in this life, and how miserable I was in my life, and how lost I became and how dangerous the game I played when I was in the military, knowing, knowing that God, knowing God's grace, knowing the judgment that can come from our sins and what we do in our sins, and how desperately I got to a point where I was wanting and ready to come back and be with the Lord. And that's where our passage comes this morning. Some of you may have heard this a week ago. I gave this at a funeral message a week ago, but I feel that this is what God wants me to share this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11 this morning. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but none uh, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven I have, and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, quick, servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found so they began to celebrate. May God add his blessing to the reading of the scripture this morning. We begin this story of a son who wanted to go his own way. You know that song? Go your own way. You know, he wanted to go his own way. And it was just like that song. He wanted his inheritance and he wants to leave. It's not really kind of shocking to us. I mean, it might be a little shocking to us to, nowadays to think about maybe he was ungrateful or the son was just not uh, a really good son. We might say that. But in that day and age, it would have been very shocking because in a, in, in a shame uh, culture, he would have shamed his father for asking for this inheritance and his father could have killed him, could have, ha could have had, him, had, him, had him killed because of the shame that he put upon his father and upon the family for asking for the inheritance. But he wants to live his own life. He wants to take all that he has, and he wants to go, and he wants to live it the way he wants to live it. He wants to do the things that he wants to do. And folks, that is where we are from the very moment that we leave our mother's womb we are the same way. 
It says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. We have all sinned. There is no one other than Jesus who came to this earth, walked this earth, and died on the cross for us that has been in this world that has not sinned. We all are sinners. It wasn't what it was supposed to be, though. It wasn't what it was supposed to be, though we are all sinners. It wasn't what we were supposed to be. Because God created us good. It said in the garden, God created us good. God created us to do good things. God created us and made us to be in a relationship with him. God did all of this. And and Adam and Eve were in the garden. It was perfect. It was beautiful. It was what the life and world was supposed to be. And God, doing that, wanted to give us the opportunity to have a choice, though. Though everything was good and we were good, he wanted us to have a choice. He never wants us to be like robots and programmed to do this, do that. He wanted us to be able to choose for ourselves. And Adam, rather than choosing God and obeying God, disobeyed the only command in the garden that he had. Not to eat from the tree of knowledge. He ate from the tree and so did Eve. And thus, sin entered the world. And because of that, we have all sinned with him, and we are born in rebellion of God. We are just like this lost son. And because we have sinned, and because sin entered the world, God had to punish sin. God is a holy God. God is a perfect God. And because God is a holy God and God is a perfect God, and because we have chose to disobey and we chose to not do what God has commanded and wanted us to do, we face consequences for the sins that we have done. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. We know that there was strife that now became between the relationship between each other, Adam and Eve, the broken relationship between us and God, and in fact, we face the ultimate consequence, which was death, the ultimate punishment. Our sins have consequences. The actions of this young man who thought the world, that he could fill himself with the things of the world, he thought he could fill him things, and and he didn't need that relationship with his father, but rather he could live his own life with his own knowledge, with his own choices, and he could live the good life, and he could fill himself with happiness and joy with the things of the world, and he thought it was going to be a great and wonderful and beautiful life, and in the end, he ends up in the pigsty with the pigs wanting to eat even what the pigs have. He lived this life of wildness if he thought this was was going to bring him joy and happiness. And when the money left, the friends left, everything left, and there he was sitting in the mud with the consequences of the things that he has done. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Sin has consequences that lead to even death. But even more than the consequences of our sins, sin has caused a disconnect between us and God. And because of that, we will never feel enjoyment. We will never feel um, accomplishment. We will never feed any of those needs that we have in our lives unless we find that to be God himself as the source of all that we need. It is only in God can we fill ourselves with the things that we need in our lives. Let me see here. Oh, when I start looking out there, I know you guys start thinking, what's he up to this this morning? God gave me an illustration. I thought, wow, this isn't going to go with the message because you're changing it, Lord. But no, he gave me an a, a interchangeable lesson this morning. Jalen, do you, do you like chocolate? Are you a chocolate eater? Do you, do you want to come up? Are you okay with coming up? Okay. Thank you, Jalen. Ghirardelli. Do you like Ghirardelli chocolates? It's really good, isn't it? It's really good chocolate. So I got some chocolate for you this morning, okay? okay. You know, chocolate is good, right? Yeah. I like chocolate. I do. 
So what I want you to do, just take a piece there. I'll try not to touch it. Take a piece, any piece. Go ahead and have some chocolate. Yeah, just, yeah, just eat it. Just go ahead, just eat it. Go ahead, go ahead. How was it? Tell me, tell me seriously, how, how was it? It's not good, is it? Well, what I gave you was baker's chocolate. Does anybody ever know what baker's chocolate is? Some of you people know what baker's chocolate is. Baker's chocolate has no sugar in it. It's just coca. And so that's the things of life. It's kind of like the things of life. We think they're going to give us enjoyment. They look good. They look like chocolate, but when we eat it, it has no sweetness. It has no goodness, and it doesn't really fill us with what we think chocolate should be. You don't have to eat the rest. You can put it back down there if you like, okay? Well, I'm not going to be mean to you, okay? I have something else this morning. I have a different chocolate, okay? Go ahead and take a piece of that. Now, you like caramel? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. That looks like the real stuff. That looks like the real stuff? Go ahead. <laughs> Is that good? Yep. All right, there you go. You can share that with your family. Go ahead. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> While the young man was in the pigsty with the pigs, he realized something. He realized all that stuff that he thought was good in his life. He thought all that stuff that would give him happiness. He thought all of that, having that inheritance and everything, led to nothing but misery, hunger. And if he could just go back home and he could just be a servant in his father's house, that servants of his father ate well better than what the situation and the place where he was. And if I could just go back... If I could just go back, I know that I'll ask for forgiveness and my father can just make me a servant. I could serve him and I can live with him in his house and I will have food on my table and I'll be treated a lot better than what I'm treated now. And so he begins to head home in the hopes that maybe his father would forgive him. And maybe his father would let him back as a servant. You know, the brokenness of this world and the brokenness of our sins sometimes makes us feel like we are not worthy of salvation. You know, sometimes when we deal with the brokenness and we deal with the brokenness of relationships and we see how people treat us and sometimes the unforgiveness that comes or we see how love comes with strings or attachments here in this world, I will, I will be your friend or I will be uh, your partner, I will be whatever it is if you do this for me and if I get this out of you back and forth. Let me tell you, the relationship of God is not like that. Because he desires to come home to be a servant, but the father desires him to come back and be his son once again. The father runs to the son the son is coming home and he sees him from a long distance and the father runs to the son. Do you realize in that day and age, he dishonors himself again. Not only did the son dishonor him by leaving in the way he left, but now the father disowns, uh, dis dishonors himself and puts shame on himself by running to his son because in that day, you didn't show your legs. And uh, you hear that, you hear that, Tim? You know, you don't show your legs. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear that, okay. But you don't show your legs in that day and that age. And, and, and he, he would have had to hike up his robe to run. He would have had to done that. And, and doing that, he exposed his legs. He exposed his shame, but he didn't care. He ran shamelessly to the sun because he knew the sun was lost. The sun was coming home. And he loved the sun so much that he was ready to take whatever it was upon him that the sun would be received once again. And that is what Jesus did on the cross for us. He took our shame. He took everything that we had done, the sins, and we no longer have to live in those sins. We no longer have to deal with those sins. We no longer have to be in those sins because Jesus took it for us and took the shame for us. 
And that is what God wants to do with us. He's not only giving us a ticket into heaven. It's not just being uh, the fact that we are going to be um, forgiven of our sins, but he's going to repair that relationship so that we can once again walk with the Father in the Father's love and to be able to have the Father's love. He came to reverse the curse of man that we could have eternal life, but even more, he came to make a way so that we can be with him forever. And that is the message of the good news. That is the message of the parable, son. That is what Jesus was saying, and that is what's available for us today. All we have to do is it says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is just and able to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I paraphrased that there this morning. (laughs) Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the message of CR. That's the message of the cross. That is the message of each For each and every one of you, when you're walking down that dark street, the Holy Spirit comes and says, hey, you are going the wrong way, and if you do not turn around right now, you're surely going to die. But if you receive Jesus Christ, he will lead you back, and you will no longer have to face the consequences, but even more, you won't have to deal with these sins anymore because God will give you the victory. And that's the message of the good news this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for your grace. Lord, I thank you for each and everyone who's come here this morning. Lord, I pray you will be with them as they leave this place. Father, go before them. Father, be with them. And Lord, I pray you'll bring them back next week so we can praise you once again. Bring them to celebrate recovery so that we can come along with one another who are struggling and say, man, we love you and there is hope and let's give you that hope and be hope dealers as uh, my brother always says. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.